Thank you for joining us today. We'll be starting in a little bit. We're going to wait for folks to trickle in for the next one or two minutes. Um, before that, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Demilola Jolayemi. I work at UCLA Center for HIV Identification, Prevention, and Treatment Services. And welcome to this virtual session. Um, it's called In Case You Missed It, Key Highlights from the 24th International AIDS Conference. And so this will be pretty much a you know, rapid format where we're going to have folks present on some abstracts that were at the AIDS 2022 conference. So um, before I go ahead and do that, we will have our moderator, um, who is Dr. Kathy Reback, and I will um, introduce her now. I'm sure by the time I do that, we'll have at least a lot of folks in already so we can actually get started early. So Dr. Kathy Reback is a senior research scientist with Friends Research Institute. She's the founder and executive director of Friends Community Center in Hollywood and the director of the CHIPS Combination, Chips Combination Prevention Corps. Her research focuses on the examination of the intersection of substance use disorders and HIV risk behaviors among sexual and gender minority individuals in community settings. Dr. Reback has an extensive background in conducting community research collaborations, managing large scale HIV prevention and intervention programs, designing and implementing technology based and M health interventions, designing and implementing venue and street based intervention programs, and evaluating behavioral and biomedical treatment therapies among sexual and gender minority populations with substance use and mental health disorders. Dr. Kathy Reback is going to be our moderator today. And with that being said, thank you again for joining us. And I'm going to go ahead and hand that over to her. She will go ahead and introduce our other speakers. Great. Thank you very much. And welcome, everybody, to this webinar. Um, I am Kathy Reback. And I um, want to just tell you a little bit about how this came about. Um, the CHIPS Combination Prevention Corps decided to organize this webinar since many of us are still not uh, traveling to in-person conferences. And we thought this would be a good way to highlight some of the key data that came out of the conference and make it possible for those of us who didn't attend to get some of the highlights. Again, this is only a few of the highlights. Um, we have three speakers today who will present on uh, various topics, and we will have the three speakers first, and then we will have questions and answers at the end. Our first speaker is Dr. Alex Duval. Dr. Duval is an Associate Professor of Behavioral Health and Bioethics at Loma Linda University. His research interests are in lef leveraging new and emerging technologies as innovative approaches for supporting the implementation of combination interventions to prevent HIV infection among groups that are epidemiologically at high risk for infection, and whose prevention needs are compiled by their socially marginalized status in their communities. Dr. Dubrow, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll share my screen. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, and um, uh, as a disclaimer, uh, I am originally from Ukraine, so my first um, abstract uh, is related to uh, care for uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees. Uh, I, and I hope, I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the first abstract I wanted to present is uh, a preliminary report on provision of HIV care to war refugees living in Ukraine, uh, living with HIV who are migrating from Ukraine. And it's a data that came out of a network of uh, 24 uh, countries and uh, 47 IT experts and providers in uh, these 24 countries uh, outlined their um, uh, barriers and facilitators to provide a better care for um, war refugees uh, coming from Ukraine to Europe. Um, for, as a background also that um, uh, HIV epidemic in Europe is the largest, uh, in Ukraine is the largest in Europe. Um, we have a very high prevalence and um, a lot of people potentially who uh, live in Ukraine during this largest refugee crisis they uh, potentially also uh, have uh, 
very complex health needs, including HIV uh, management. And so um, uh, from this conversation with uh, or uh, survey of 47 uh, infectious disease providers, they uh, um, said that uh, about 64, 64% of clinics uh, in their countries were registering about uh, 10 refugees a week. However, during the presentation, it was also mentioned that um, the demand uh, was steadily growing because a lot of uh, many refugees who are coming uh, to Europe were not aware of services available or not knowing how to access them. So uh, they first were settling, now that the demand grows. Um, in, uh, comparing to other refugees from Afghanistan or Syria or other countries, 91% um, of clinics had no or very few non Ukrainian refugees, um, which may indicate either lower prevalence or preferential treatment. Um, uh, countries, all countries uh, instituted um, uh, special provisions for refugees uh, to facilitate their connection to healthcare. 70% provided universal healthcare insurance, uh, waived administrative requirements to access HIV care. Um, more than half offered same day doctor's consultation, and uh, they also had uh, same day ART dispensing. Um, there are, they highlighted several barriers to HIV care uh, for refugees. Um, number one barrier highlighted was uh, lack of medical documentation. Um, uh, and um, the way to deal with it, uh, most of the clinics uh, required the either written or spoken declaration uh, from um, refugees coming to get treatment. And 41% uh, were just asking for HIV tests. Um, uh, number one, the second barrier was uh, shortage of medical translators, about 64% of clinics uh, suggested that that was the um, uh, problem they were dealing with, and uh, especially there were some ethical issues coming uh, for refugees coming from Ukraine and availability of Russian translators versus people who were preferring Ukrainian language. Uh, there was also um, issues with certified translators versus volunteer translators. Um, and uh, whether or not clinics should use uh, volunteer translators as well. Um, number three barrier was um, uh, lack of information about previous treatment, and especially in Ukraine, uh, most of the patients coming from Ukraine use dolotegravir-based um, treatment, uh, while countries in Europe have this treatment available, um, generic version of it is not available, and so uh, 64% of uh, clinics in these different countries kept the same treatment, while 36% switched to available, mostly treatment-based treatment. Uh, number four barriers was uh, worsening mental health. It was not as much highlighted, but um, in uh, other round tables during the conference, it was noted that um, the trauma of more war and mental strain or of uncertainty, um, whether or not this refugee will be able to return home, it um, compounds their ability to uh, uh, receive treatment and be adherent to treatment. Um, another barrier was also um, awaiting governmental support uh, for the integration of refugees. There are several parties. Uh, uh, political parties in Bulgaria and Slovakia that uh, openly criticizing this um, support of refugees. Uh, and number six barriers was uh, the need to shift to a longer term care such as TB screening and treatment and um, gynecological and reproductive health care for women. Um, so uh, that's um, the situation uh, with refugees coming from Ukraine and uh, how it looks in Europe. Uh, the second abstract that I found very interesting. Hi, Dr. Dubov. Sorry, can you oh. switch your, swap your displays, please, so oh. we can see? Just yes, I was not sure. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, the second abstract is um, pooled estimates of uh, hepatitis C incidents among uh, gay bisexual men using PrEP. Uh, this presentation was by a team from Australia, uh, had, headed by Dr. Traeger. And um, as a highlight, um, or main conclusion from this presentation, uh, that HCV incidence now is four times lower than it was before broad access direct antiretroviral um, 
treatment. Uh, uh, so uh, it used to be before 1.27. Uh, uh, now it's 0 0.3 per 100 person years uh, incidence. And so uh, as a background that um, there was a, there were many concerns that widespread of scale up uh, and scale up of PrEP may increase HCV uh, incidence among HIV negative uh, gain by sexual men. And um, the team from Monash and other universities uh, set up to examine the impact of broad uh, uh, access uh, of um, direct and retroviral treatment availability on HCV incidence in uh, studies of uh, gain by sexual men using a PrEP. So they conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of 17 studies um, of approximately 18,000 uh, participants reporting uh, on HCV incidents among again by sexual men using PrEP in high income countries. Uh, they reviewed studies between 2015 and 2022. 20, uh, um, and um, they found that um, uh, there was a lower prevalence of HCV exposure uh, before broad access DAAs, uh, 1.75%. Uh, percent of uh, gain by sexual men starting PrEP had HCV antibodies, comparing to after the broad uh, access DAs, uh, 0 0.63. And they also found uh, lower CV RNA prevalence, uh, indicating chronic disease. Um, the prevalence was 0 0.95 percent versus prevalence after the broad access DA implementation was 0 0.24. And so the conclusion was that reduction in community level HCV varemia occurred due to DA uptake among uh, gain by sexual men prior to PrEP scale up. And the, the same team also um, reported on another study um, looking at a very similar question, but um, among people who live with HIV. So they uh, reported the results of a study recruiting 6,195 uh, people with a virological evidence of HCV uh, clearance and uh, people living with HIV. Uh, they were 81% males, 46% gay and bisexual men, and 34% people who inject drugs. And they found incidence of reinfection with HCV 18% lower, and especially 54% lower uh, significant reduction in people who inject drugs. So um, that's the second abstract I wanted to highlight. Um, the third abstract uh, was presented by um, Cepeda, Dr. Sepeda Javier and uh, his team, um, and they reported on the impact and cost effectiveness of police education program on HIV and overdose among people who inject drugs uh, in Tijuana, Mexico. So they reported um, uh, or highlighted um, results of a project shield uh, uh, Project Shield provided training to uh, 1,800 police officers in Tijuana between 2015 and 2018. Um, and the training was uh, aiming to improve their knowledge and behaviors related to HIV and injection drug use. Uh, they um, uh, uh, highlighted in the training uh, laws around um, uh, syringe position and harm reductions. And they uh, uh, educated police officers on uh, HIV prevention and uh, the importance of harm reduction sites. And um, as the background uh, for this study, um, certain position uh, has been decriminalized in Mexico, but uh, regardless of decriminalization, arrest for possession of syringes still persists, and police often targets harm reduction sites, which uh, triples the risk of syringe sharing. Uh, and risk behavior also, um, uh, it also obviously reduces uh, the willingness of people to use harm reduction sites. And uh, we know that um, if people get incarcerated, uh, they have a significant risk of uh, fetal overdoses post-release. Um, so it compounds ability to provide harm reduction and treatment to people who need it. And so the, the aims of the study was to longitudinally examine the sustained impact of educational interventions on drug law enforcement practices that contribute public health. And they also wanted to assess the training impact on arrests for syringe possession in Tijuana. 
And so the highlight is the main highlight or takeaway from this study. Um, they uh, were able to show that uh, program shield has reduced the risk of uh, people who inject drugs. And it's a cost-effective way to prevent HIV in fatal overdoses. Um, here are a few more highlights from, uh, from this um, presentation. Um, the team noticed a decrease in arrest rates. Um, for, for example, arrest for heroin position fell from 44% to 31% uh, during the two years where they trained officers and then uh, followed them up. Arrest for syringe position declined from 41% to 20%. And um, this data was also supported by uh, the data from cohorts of uh, people who inject drugs uh, who were 68% less likely to have been imprisoned post training. So um, it's kind of um, data coming from multiple sources. The team has also conducted modeling uh, studies to estimate impact of or of this training program on HIV infections and fatal overdoses and also model cost effectiveness. So they found that um, um, according to modeling studies, 1.7% uh, fewer inf uh, HIV infections were projected within two years after the training and 3.1% fewer HIV infections 10 years after the training. Uh, however, the, significant, uh, the impact on fatal overdoses was more significant with 9% reduction in fatal overdoses within two years and 14% uh, fewer overdoses after 10 years. And um, they also model cost effectiveness and, this, and the conclusion of the team was that despite the high cost of training program, it was um, the costs were offset by the decline in incarceration related costs and also in the ART costs. And so as a conclusion, the, um, the team suggested that short training was associated with sustained improvements in HIV and high production knowledge among officers and the corresponding reductions in arrests of uh, people who inject drugs. However, as the limitation of the study, there was no control group, so um, it will be uh, important and interesting to conduct uh, a similar study with a control group. And um, the last study I wanted to highlight is the study of um, uh, gain by sexual men in Canada and um, the way they uh, manage sexual risks um, during the COVID-19, especially during the early uh, months of pandemic. Uh, so as a background, um, uh, the team suggested that Canadian gain back sexual men used knowledge gained from HIV prevention uh, to inform their protective behaviors during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the negotiations um, of COVID-19 safety was very similar to um, negotiation of HIV or STI risks uh, um, among men previously. They use the same approaches in knowledge. And the team conducted 93 um, in-depth interviews with the gain back sexual men in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. Um, the, their interviewers were, uh, interviewees were um, mostly middle-aged or younger uh, participants, so 22% in their 20s, 40 in their 30s, and 13% in their 40s. Uh, the, um, the group was uh, ethnically diverse, only 36% of interview uh, participants were white, and one in five men uh, uh, had HIV infection. Uh, as a result, uh, about one quarter of uh, participants practiced abstinence to avoid uh, sex uh, when COVID-19 struck in the beginning of the pandemic, while uh, one third adopted uh, temporary monogamy. Um, Fewer than half of the interviewed maintained uh, sexual relations uh, with both casual and uh, regular partners as uh, COVID-19 spread. And they used um, these uh, four uh, preventative practices, asking about health status, asking how often uh, potential partners go out, wear a mask, got tested during co for COVID-19, and asking how they feel um, and whether they have COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, some uh, practiced uh, reduction of physical contact. They uh, suggested wearing masks during sex or limiting sex to mutual masturbation. Um, some resorted to sex with regular partners. Um, they limited sex to those partners who was known as a, a COVID-19 tested, tested status. And uh, the uh, last uh, 
practice they employed was vaccine status sorting. So uh, they increase sexual activities after receiving COVID-19 vaccination and use vaccine status uh, to sort sexual partners only uh, to those who also received COVID-19 vaccination. So I think this uh, study is also relevant now in the view of um, monkeypox spread and potential same practices used. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Debo. We appreciate you uh, attending those sessions and reporting back to us. And our next reporter, or our next presenter, who will who will uh, provide an overview of uh, presentations is Dr. Rafael Landovitz. Dr. Landovitz is a professor of medicine at the UCLA Center for Clinical AIDS Research and Education. He is also the center co-director at CHIPS. He has led combination prevention intervention studies and projects using PEP and PrEP strategies for MSM and trans women, as well as being part of the leadership group of the DAIDS funded AIDS clinical trial groups, the ACTG, the AIDS, um, HIV Prevention Trials Network, the HPTN, and the former Adolescence Trials Network, the ATN. He is the protocol chair of HPTN 083 and involved in HPTN 084. These are clinical trials evaluating long-acting inject injectable cabotepravir for uh, PrEP use. And Dr. Landovitz, we'll turn it over to you now uh, for your um, presentation. Thanks, Kathy. Um, thanks again for the uh, invitation to share some highlights. Um, can people hear me okay and see my slides? Yes. I'll assume, I'll assume yes. Okay, great. Um, so these are just a couple of abstracts that I thought were particularly interesting. Um, I just want to be really clear. I think Kathy and Domi both uh, emphasized this before. This isn't comprehensive. These are just things. Another disclaimer is I actually did not attend the conference in person. So um, this is from my reading of the abstracts and from chatting with other people who did attend it. So the first um, presentation I wanted to hire, hi highlight, and um, this is admittedly a little bit um, uh, self-serving is this is a study that I was involved with, HPTN-083, which was a phase three study of cabotegravir for PrEP in cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men. Um, my co-chair on the protocol, Beatrice Grinstein from Theo Cruz Institute in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, presented um, uh, detailed data from the transgender women who were enrolled in HPTN-083, um, uh, in particular evaluating the effect of um, gender affirming hormone therapy on cabotegravir pharmacokinetics. So this study enrolled 570 um, self-identified transgender women into the study. The overall enrollment was 4,566. Um, and um, uh, in terms of characterizing the population, they were all over the world. This study um, enrolled at 43 sites in seven countries, including the US, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, South Africa, Thailand, and Vietnam. Um, and you can see here the overall um, rates of incident sexually transmitted infections, um, as well as people who had uh, side effects attributable to the cabotegravir um, or its placebo um, in this trial. And I will share with you, I, the, we did not do a direct comparison of the transgender um, women uh, to the cisgender men who have sex with men cohort, but rather just compared between the two arms that were studied. I will tell you though, overall, the rates of sexually transmitted infections that were incident were slightly numerically higher than in the cisgender MSM cohort, but those were not statistically significant. You can see they weren't different between um, the two treatment arms um, in terms of their statistical significance either. And there were no appreciable differences in the rate of adverse events of the study products for the transgender women. Um, these are the gender affirming hormone therapies that the transgender women in the study were using. Um, you can uh, see the proportions overall who were using each agent, the portions, proportions who reported such use at baseline, and then um, the proportions who um, uh, initiated uh, gender-affirming hormone therapy in follow-up. 
Um, and I think perhaps the most, uh, the data most of interest um, uh, that came out of this abstract was this, which shows you um, the cabotegravir pharmacokinetics among the transgender women who uh, reported use of gender affirming hormone therapy in the red dotted line compared to the aqua solid line for the transgender women who did not. And the long story short um, is these are essentially overlapping and there were no significant um, interactions between gender affirming hormone therapy and cabotegravir. The biggest data gap that comes out of this, of course, is this does not show you the effect of cabotegravir on the gender affirming hormone therapy levels um, and their phenotypic effects on populations. Um, that was um, unfortunately not able to be evaluated in this study because standardized gender affirming hormone therapies were not used in this study. People were allowed to use whatever they had access to and it wasn't supplied by the protocol. Um, there are some data in the contraceptive literature that show that some feminizing hormones um, have been studied in comparison to, uh, in the context of use of cabotegravir, and those were not affected by cabotegravir use. That, of course, is not the same thing as studying it with designated gender affirming hormone therapy. So that remains a significant data gap. I will also tell you that there was a lot of discussion about the distressingly high rates of sexual, um, emotional, and physical violence that the transgender women enrolled in this study reported throughout the study. Um, and that is a topic that really we probably could talk about for an hour unto itself and deserves an enormous amount of research um, and interventional attention. So the conclusions from this abstract were that Cab LA was safe and effective, um, uh, not only for the overall population, but specifically for transgender women. Um, there was a median follow-up of 1.4 years of the transgender women in this study. It, uh, Cab LA was superior to TDF-FTC in preventing incident HIV infection and provided high levels of overall protection to the trans women. And the occurrence of adverse events was not different between the study arms for the transgender women. And again, as I mentioned, the initial findings suggest that gender affirming hormone therapy does not impact Cab concentrations, but a major data gap remains the other bi-directional interaction. So the, the next uh, abstract I want to talk about um, is uh, the sister study of HPTN 083 called 084, which was done in cisgender women in sub-Saharan Africa or the global south. Um, the primary results had been uh, presented previously and are now published in Lancet by my colleague Sinead Delaney Moretlewey from the Witz Institute um, in South Africa. And you'll remember those initial results were stunning. Um, they showed um, an 88% reduction in HIV incidence in the cisgender women randomized to cabotegravir for PrEP compared to TDF, FTC. And um, these incidence rates that are shown here on this slide of 0 0.2 for the cabotegravir arm and 1.85 per 100 person years for the TDF, FTC arm really showed this remarkable impact of cabotegravir um, among cisgender women where the background HIV incidence rates, depending on what study you look at, could be anywhere between four and nine per hundred person years. So these are really staggering results. So what um, Sinead and her colleagues presented at this conference was um, the one year unblinded data. So the study was stopped early um, by a data safety monitoring board and they unblinded everyone. And while they were getting an open label extension to offer everybody the superior product, um, they did uh, have the opportunity to follow people for an additional year. Um, and overall, now total in the study, they have six incident HIV infections in the cabotegravir arm since the study began, and 56 incident infections in the TDF FTC arm. Um, and it's essentially a, uh, a, a, a persistently stunningly good result. 89% reduction in HIV incidence, even when you unblind the study um, for cabotegravir compared um, to TDF FTC. Those of you who sort of have been following this saga of the cabotegravir infections and the effect that cabotegravir as a long acting antiviral has on HIV diagnostics will appreciate this somewhat complicated slide. But the, really what the only, I would like everyone to take away from this is you see the, 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 the row on the bottom of this slide called DX. That is the one participant who acquired HIV with pretty much on time injections of cabotegravir. I say pretty much because you'll see some hatched bars where there were slight delays in cabotegravir injections 
on two occasions, one of which immediately antedated the HIV acquisition event, but all of the other um, incident HIV infections happened in the, in the context of clear non-administration of study product. So really in this incredibly large number of person years of follow-up um, in 084, there's been one incident HIV infection um, uh, with, uh, with the proper use of the injectable product. So that's really an incredible result. It's also beginning to expand our database on, on the effect um, and safety um, of cabotegravir in pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes. They've now clocked 57 um, women who, as, as Sinead likes to say, fell pregnant. That's the sort of global term that is used um, during the study. Um, 23 in the CAB arm and 34 in the TDF-FTC arm. And I would orient you to the last row of the table. There've been no congenital anomalies noted in any of these. This is still a small data set and they are planning an ongoing cohort with their open label extension to look at additional pregnancy outcomes and infant outcomes. Um, importantly, um, in that open label extension, um, a previous requirement that if someone fell pregnant that they stop receiving cabotegravir injections is being removed and women who fall pregnant while um, uh, uh, obtaining cabotegravir for PrEP will allow, be allowed to continue receiving cabotegravir for PrEP um, in this open label extension, which is much needed and really critical data um, as we anticipate global rollout of cabotegravir for PrEP. So these were their conclusions. CAB continues to be superior to TDF-FTC in preventing HIV infection for cisgender women, 89% um, lower risk of HIV incidence. Um, there um, uh, uh, really were no new safety concerns identified. The pregnancy incidence did increase in the unblinded period and that um, reaffirms the importance of ongoing evaluation of CAB safety and pharmacology in pregnancy. Um, and CAB access should be a priority for populations with greatest need, which is a perfect segue to the next abstract I'm gonna talk about, which is at this conference, the WHO released updated PrEP guidance that now includes the use of cabotegravir. So these are the guidelines. They came out right before the conference and caused a tremendous amount of excitement. So this technically wasn't an abstract, so I'm sort of cheesing this a little bit and I hope you'll forgive me, but I thought it was really important. Cab, um, the WHO's global recommendation is now that long-acting injectable cabotegravir may be offered as an additional prevention choice for people at substantial risk of HIV infection as part of combination prevention approaches. I think that's really important because that really is permissive for global programs to start including cabotegravir in their national prevention portfolios and for um, demonstration projects to um, continue to optimize um, how to do implementation. This is a lot of text and I'm happy to share these slides later because I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but um, you've heard me and others likely talk a lot about these delays in HIV diagnostics that long acting cabotegravir comes with that makes it harder to diagnose breakthrough HIV infections. And the WHO took a very pragmatic approach to this. They said, if you demand these more sensitive diagnostics globally, you're really gonna impede rollout. You're gonna make it infeasible in low and middle income country settings. And you're gonna prevent the deployment of this really powerful prevention strategy in places where it is desperately needed. So they took a very pragmatic approach and said, you do the best HIV testing that you have available in country, and that's the best you can do, and that's okay. And that should not get in the way of global rollout. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that if people are confused about that or are not quite clear about what I'm talking about, about the delays in HIV diagnostics. Um, the next abstract I wanted to talk about um, is moving a little bit um, away from uh, HIV prevention, but it's all of course intimately related. Um, uh, Annie Lutkemeyer from University of California, San Francisco presented these data that there, there had already been a press release about before the conference, sort of presaging this finding that post-exposure doxycycline for cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men was highly effective at reducing curable STIs. Um, so really, um, a biomedical prevention strategy for these non-HIV bacterial STIs. And this also was presaged by John michelle Molina's um, uh, data from the IPERGASE study where post-exposure doxycycline at a dose of 200 milligrams was shown to reduce 
incident gonorrhea, sorry, not gonorrhea, syphilis and chlamydia by about 70% in the hypergay study. So this was a randomized open label study that looked at the same thing at two sites in Seattle and San Francisco in the US. So um, uh, individuals were uh, randomized to either doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis, that's 200 milligrams, that's a double dose what you would normally use um, uh, as a single dose. And um, the hypergay study said you could do it up to three times in a week. This study said you could use it up to once per day. And it was supposed to be administered within 72 hours um, after condomless sexual contact. And these are the overall results. And they broke this down by people who were in the PrEP cohort. So people who were not living with HIV and people who were living with HIV. And those are the two histogram sets here. And the bottom line is, um, there's about a two thirds reduction in overall bacterial STIs in both groups, which is really powerful. And if you look a little bit more carefully broken down by the individual STIs over on, um, on the right in the table, this is really stunning. It ranges between um, about 70% and about 65% reduction um, pretty consistently, whether it's someone who is HIV negative or someone who's living with HIV, um, and it included gonorrhea. And this was unexpected because of the high rates of, of resistance to doxycycline um, for gonorrhea isolates in the community. And this was not seen in the hypergay study. So what's missing before we say this is all ready for prime time um, are resistance data and changes in the microbiome. So is this gonna drive resistance? Is this gonna cause more resistance, not only for gonorrhea, but for Staph aureus isolates, it's gonna disrupt the microbiome. And I, but I think we're accumulating data and we're gonna see this being part um, of STI prevention strategies going forward. Um, so I, I don't wanna um, take up a lot of time because I want Amanda to be able to have time, but I did wanna um, mentioned one last abstract that I thought was really important. It was a cohort study called We Speak that looked at the social determinants associated with HIV misconceptions from heterosexual black men in Ontario, Canada. And it was part of a longitudinal cohort study that really had three phases. And it started with focus groups and in-depth interviews for African Caribbean and black men in Ottawa. Um, and then they did surveys and then they're doing concept mapping. And what was really interesting was 866 um, men completed this questionnaire and they looked at the social determinants that were associated with misconceptions about HIV um, and with fewer misconceptions. And I suppose it, it really shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that men who experienced more discrimination and had negative attitudes toward condoms had more misconceptions about HIV on this standardized scale. And um, being born in Canada as opposed to um, a lower middle income country, having higher education and having higher measures of resiliency on standardized um, measures as well also was associated with fewer misconceptions. And so the authors um, uh, really emphasize something that I think we all know intuitively, but it's really nice to see it emphasized um, at an international conference like this, that access to education alongside HIV literacy, anti-discrimination policies, including anti-racism in healthcare and resilience building are critical to developing effective HIV responses and debunking HIV misconceptions among Black um, and Afro-Caribbean men. Um, so I'll stop there and thank you. And I wanna give Amanda enough time to uh, talk about her abstracts. And thank you, Dr. Landavis. And we are now going to turn to Dr. Amanda Miller as she will present um, a series of, uh, uh, a summary of a series of presentations that she uh, went to at the conference. Dr. Amanda Miller is a second year postdoc in the Division of Infectious Disease at the David Gevin School of Medicine here at UCLA. Dr. Miller's research primarily focuses on the synergy between alcohol use, experiences of inter-partner uh, violence and HIV. As a postdoc, she has been working closely under the mentorship of Drs. Davy, Shoptaw, and Gorbach to address prenatal alcohol use among pregnant and breastfeeding women who are at high risk of HIV infection or living with HIV in South Africa. Dr. Miller. Thank you for that introduction. Okay, I'll jump right in. Um, I just want to say it was so exciting to go see science presented in real life again. 
Um, this is me being way too excited in the front row because I thought that um, Anthony Fauci would be speaking in person, but I was just really close to a Zoom screen. Um, but nonetheless, it was still a great conference. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about four uh, abstracts that were of particular interest to me. Um, the first uh, is called Trends in Prep Inequity by Race and Census Region in the United States. And this was presented by Patrick Sullivan um, from Emory University, and it was presented at the Co-Chair's Choice session. So the rationale for this work is that um, we need to develop a metric in order to understand and measure inequity in PrEP use, um, because understanding inequity is really how we're going to um, meet PrEP needs and scale up our programming. Um, and so in order to better quantify um, PrEP inequity, uh, this research team developed the PNR, which is the PrEP to need ratio. Um, and this is a health equity metric where the numerator is the number of PrEP users in a given group and the denominator is the number of new diagnoses in that group in the same year. Um, <clears throat> so to complete this analysis, this research group used commercial pharmacy data um, from 2012 to 2021 to enumerate the number of PrEP users in the United States. And a limitation of this analysis is they actually only had um, race data for one third of the participants that were in this commercial pharmacy uh, database. Um, and so if you look to the right, this is one of the slides. And I wanna, I don't know if folks are familiar with AIDS View. I hadn't used it before, but it's a really cool data visualization platform. And um, they have added this PNR data. It's now live. It's been added as of when this um, abstract was presented. And so if this is something you're interested in, you can now go and um, look at PNR by different, you can stratify by different populations and locations and cities in the United States. Um, so looking at this slide, you can see that um, this shows the PNR by race and ethnicity in the four different geographic regions of the United States. And if you look to the right side in the Northeast, you'll see that the blue arrows are indicating a um, growth in inequity by race slash ethnic group over time since rollout of PrEP, um, where now we see in 2021, we see a larger gap than we had seen in any of the preceding years. And so among um, white individuals in the Northeast, the prep coverage, I think that's a 42, the PNR is 42, which means 42 individuals are on um, prep for every one in incident case that year in that population. And you'll see that the yellow and red lines close to the bottom are the Hispanic and black population and coverage is much lower in the black population at 4.5, um, at a PNR of 4.5%. So a massive inequity. As I mentioned, there was missing um, socio-demographic data, which is a limitation. However, the, um, the uh, researchers didn't notice any uh, um, variance by region in this missing data um, and didn't notice differences by race among those who did, didn't, didn't have race data. So they kind of minimized this concern. Um, all regions demonstrated increases in racial prep and equity over time, which is of course concerning. Um, and the US South lagged, it had the lowest PNR across all groups of any of the four regions. Uh, a separate ecological study found that PNR was higher in states with Medicaid expansion for um, PrEP drug assistance programs or both of these programs, meaning that coverage was better in locations that had these states that had these services available. Um, and better programs are needed to address PrEP in communities that have greatest risk of infection. And additional work is actually gonna be needed now to utilize this PNR metric and um, try and use it to understand how policies and interventions are actually impacting and potentially exacerbating prep, prep inequity. Uh, the second abstract I thought was really interesting was called Medical Drones to Support HIV Differentiated Service Delivery in an Island Population in Uganda. And this um, work was presented by Rosalind Parks uh, Ratanchi from the Infectious Disease Institute in Kampala. So um, the premise of this work is that there are a lot of individuals who experience an extremely high burden of HIV in remote areas and who are part of um, highly mobile populations where it's difficult to consistently access antiretroviral therapy. So this work took place on a series of islands in Lake Victoria in um, Uganda. And these island, in, on these islands, the HIV prevalence is 27% and ART loss to follow-up rate is 50%. Um, so the, the idea here is that a drone costs 10, this type of drone costs $10,000 and the existing boat service is around 90,000. So perhaps a drone may be a cost effective um, method for delivering ART and other um, timely medications to uh, hard to reach populations such as the fisher folk on these islands. 
And I wanted to just explain this picture. This is actually um, somebody that they trained in the community um, to essentially receive the drones. And so this individual is one of, I think eight, I'll verify that on the next slide, eight community workers that was trained. They're provided with this mat, which they lay out on the ground whenever it's time for the drone to deliver treatment. Um, they communicate on the phone with the person flying the drone. And um, once the drone lands, they remove the medications and they place an invoice into the drone um, saying that the medications have been received and then help to, um, guide the drone back up over the phone. So um, after this uh, kind of quasi experiment has finished, they've now uh, initiated five routes that serve a total of 17 um, HIV peer support groups and which in, um, contain 94 persons living with HIV. The average amount of time it took the drones to travel from the mainland to each of the islands was nine minutes, which is compared to 35 minutes for the average boat ride. Uh, they successfully trained eight peer workers like that woman on the previous slide um, to coordinate the drone landings. Uh, some really important things to think about in terms of trying to scale up this work moving forward is that multi-level stakeholder involvement is critical in an ongoing capacity. So these drones obviously are using up airspace, so coordination needs to be involved on a government level, even also with the Defense Department. Um, and one of the things that they uh, kind of posed at the end was that they're really trying to figure out how to uh, make this a, a potentially um, profitable um, venture for the Ugandan government. So in addition to expanding to other medications that might make this a more sustainable program, was there any way that this could economically benefit the communities that were being served um, or benefit the government in, on a larger scale in order to kind of entice them to want to support the scale up of this type of program? The next uh, lecture that I, or the next um, abstract I wanna present on was looking at um, the introduction and scale up of a dual HIV syphilis um, rapid diagnostic testing program to eliminate mother to child transmission in Nigeria. And this work was presented by Andrew Story from the Clinton Health Access Initiative. And I should note because he noted that um, the reason that he was presenting this work is that the first author was unable to secure her visa to travel, which for those of you that attended the conference, you know that um, a lot of people were unable to attend and present their work in person because of visa issues. So the rationale for this work is that there's still a tremendous public health burden attributable to congenital syphilis. Um, it is the, I think the second leading cause of stillbirth in the world, and it is entirely preventable and treatment is extremely inexpensive at about 60 cents a day. Um, over the last 20 years, we've done a tremendous job of scaling up HIV testing programs through antenatal care and the kind of um, driving argument of this present presentation was that we can do the same for syphilis and it shouldn't be that hard because we should be able to rely on this model of HIV testing um, and integrate into those existing services. So um, this research took place at 31 facilities between 2019 and 2020 in Nigeria, where um, uh, dual HIV and syphilis testing was introduced in antenatal care in these 31 clinics. And the slide on the right just shows the red bar is coverage for HIV testing in antenatal care across various um, sub-Saharan African countries where the blue bar shows syphilis coverage. And you can see there's quite a disparity between the two. So they were able to, over this year, they were able to reach over 45,000 pregnant women um, of whom they were able to get 92% um, who tested positive to initiate treatment. Um, it was also uh, fairly effective at reaching partners who were syphilis positive with 42% of women who tested positive getting their partners into care as well. And um, the, uh, the Nigerian government felt that this pilot was really promising and suggested that there was a pathway forward for a national scale up. And so um, in addition to international donors, the um, Nigerian Department of Health itself has invested quite a bit of money to try and bring this um, project to scale over the next couple of years. And the fourth and final abstract that I wanna uh, talk to you about today, it was entitled Association of Prenatal Prep Exposure with Neurodevelopmental and Growth Outcomes Beyond 24 Months Among Ken Kenyan Children. And this work was presented by Lauren Gomez of the University of Washington, and she actually won the um, Early Stage Investigator Award for the EPI track for this work. 
Um, so the rationale for this research is that, um, you know, there's a growing evidence base around um, safety of PrEP use among pregnant women, uh, but most of this work uh, has been looking at the safety in PrEP exposed infants has relied on outcomes that are less than a year after birth, and um, there is a dearth of neurodevelopmental outcome data. So this work um, looked at a subset of mother-child dyads participating in an ongoing randomized control trial in Western Kenya. And um, they, followed in, they followed participants um, for 36 months postpartum and they, collect, uh, they assessed outcomes at 24, 30, and 36 months. And they did this by looking at um, a number of growth indicators such as weight, stunting, length, um, and proportion underweight. And then they also used an early developmental screener. And as you can see on the slide on the right, um, in this figure, you can compare the PrEP exposed to unexposed infants, and you can see that for the outcomes of underweight and stunting across time points, there were no differences um, by PrEP exposure status. And not presented in this slide, I can also tell you that um, there was no difference in ASQ SE2 score, which is the developmental scale, or length or weight at any of the follow up periods by PrEP exposure status. So this work is consistent with existing safety data um, and the next steps for this research team is they're going to quantify the actual level of TDF exposure in hair and dried blood um, DBS samples and then they're also going to look longer term at uh, two different outcomes including bone mineral density as well as use of a neurocognitive tool, um, uh, the Malawi Developmental Assessment Tool. And with that I'm going to end because I know we want to have time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And I um, hope all of you will join me in thanking um, the three presenters. They had the uh, daunting task of going to presentations or learning about these particular presentations and then pre taking them and presenting them to all of us um, as if they were the PIs on the study. And I think you all did a, a fantastic job of giving us the information so it felt like we were there. We will now take uh, questions from the chat. And if you have any questions specific to uh, any of these abstracts, please put them in the, in the chat. And um, Dami, are you there? Yes. Yeah. You are going to go into the chat and read the questions for us. So at this moment, we don't have any questions in the chat. If you all have questions, please feel free to post it or raise your hand. If you would prefer to, you, we can unmute you and you can um, ask your question. Sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> all right. Okay, still no questions. All right, I see a question in the chat. This is from Paula Tavro. What is the cost of capotegravir for women and how many times per year? And I believe this question will be for Dr. Um, Landovitz. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I assume, uh, Paula, that you're interested in the price, for example, in the Global South, um, which hasn't actually been announced yet. Um, the company that makes the product um, uh, is it waiting for there to be the first regulatory approval in the area before they're going to announce the retail price. But at the conference, they did announce a partnership with um, the Global Medicines Patent Pool um, to um, allow the technology for the um, production of Cab LA um, to be uh, you know, taken on by generic manufacturers. Um, I will caution everyone not to get too excited about that just yet, because I'm told that it's probably going to be three to five years before manufacturing um, will be able to be up and at scale um, for that to actually impact um, pricing um, and scalability. In the United States, I see um, Bert is asking, it's $22,000 a year is the retail price. Um, it is being covered by Medicare, most private insurances, 
And I believe I heard that it was going to be or is being covered by Medi-Cal as well. Um, and I'm told actually without prior authorization, um, but obviously it, the healthcare system costs are significant. And I'm sorry, Paula, you asked how many times a year? It's every two months, I'm sorry. So it's, it's basically six times a year. Sorry, Dummy. No worries, there's another question in the chat. I know you already um, responded to the cost question. Um, can you say anything about the two people with HIV who are reported to be cured of HIV? So the, 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 uh, the extremely knowledgeable Dr. Hardy asked that question and he probably knows more about these, um, these situations than, than, than I do since I was not at the conference. But my understanding is that they were similar to what we've seen before with people who received either stem cell transplants or bone marrow transplants um, with um, CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous um, uh, transplant material in the context of there being a malignancy. And we have fairly short-term follow-up at this point. And that's sort of always the million dollar question with these, these cure situations is um, these technologies, which unfortunately currently are not really scalable and really can only be used in the context of someone needing a bone marrow transplant for a very severe oncologic or or cancerous condition, um, uh, you know, how durable are they going to be? And and while it's exciting as more proof of principle, um, I really don't think um, uh, it's unfortunately it's not ready for prime time yet. I don't see any other questions. All right, I would like to once again, thank um, Amanda, Alex and Raphael for your presentations. We greatly appreciate doing you doing this work so that you could bring us all up to speed on what we missed. And we thank all of you for attending this webinar. We want to remind you to complete the evaluation by using the uh, link that is provided to you in chat, and the link will also be emailed to you. And I also want to note that the uh, webinar has been recorded, and within a short period of time, it will be posted on the CHIPS website. Thank you all again.